There aren't too many people who have survived more near-death experiences than Louis Zamperini. After uh, volunteering for the Army Air Forces, Zamperini survived months of flight training when thousands of others did not. He survived bombing missions under heavy fire, one of which left 600 600 bullet holes in the fuselage of his B-24. After mechanical failure sent his plane plunging into the Pacific Ocean, he survived the crash. And that's when his real survival story began. He lived for weeks on a small inflatable raft baked by the sun. Tossed by violent storms, he fought off sharks, he dodged bullets from Japanese aircraft, and then he spent two years as a prisoner of war, transferred from one horrific camp to another, suffering relentlessly under forced labor, starvation, disease, and merciless torture. Reading his story, it makes sense that Zamperini's biography, Unbroken, is called a story of survival. It does make sense. But nearly 70 years after this survival story, Zamperini faced what his family called the greatest challenge of his life, a 40-day battle with pneumonia. And this battle was one he could not survive. On July 2nd, 2014, Louis Zamperini died. Survival stories like Zamperini's are captivating. They draw us in. But zoom out far enough and you'll realize something about stories like this. There's no such thing as a survival story. Nobody gets out of life alive. There are few topics preachers can preach on that apply to everyone equally, but death is one of those. It's a fundamental human experience that cuts across space and time, ethnicity and class. But in our cultural context, it's not something we think about very often. And the stark reality is that the Bible talks about death more than we do. Two verses from the Psalms that will serve as an exhortation for our meditation today. Psalm 39, verse 4 says, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We'll meditate on three ideas this morning. We're going to look at death's invisibility, death's commentary, and death's subservience. Death's invisibility, death's commentary, and death's subservience. First, death's invisibility. Blaise Pascal wrote, Imagine a number of men in chains, all under sentence of death, some of whom are each day butchered in the sight of the others. Those remaining see their own condition and that of their fellows, and looking at each other with grief and despair, await their turn. This is an image of the human condition. Pretty dark, wouldn't you say? Why don't you imagine yourself in Pascal's nightmare? You're in a line of prisoners, all condemned to die by firing squad. You hear the captain's call, ready, aim, fire. You hear the shots ring out. You hear a body drop to the ground. And then you hear it all over again. This time, a little bit closer. One by one, those in line are killed, and each death foreshadows your own. This is how Pascal views all of life. Every death he sees around him forecasts his own. 
He, he lived with a kind of solidarity with the dying that is mostly unknown to us. Now, some of us, due to our circumstances, find ourselves in proximity to the dying, but that's not likely true of the majority of us. The striking reality is that no generation in human history has been more insulated from death than ours. For example, 300 years ago, it was impossible to avoid death because it was everywhere. As one historian put it, death dwelt within the family. What he means is that it happened within the walls of every home. If you lived in Mandover, Andover, Massachusetts in the uh, late 1600s, the average married couple um, would give birth to 12 children. Excuse me, nine children. <laughs> nine children. Nine children, three of whom would die before the age of 21. Or take as an example the family of Cotton Mother. Cotton was a um, New England minister in the 1600s. He was the father of 14 children. Seven of his 14 children died as infants shortly after they were born. Another child died at two years of age. Of the six children who survived to adulthood, five of those six died in their 20s. Only one of his 14 children outlived him. And Mother enjoyed all the medical advantages available to anyone at that time, and he still ends up burying 13 of his 14 kids. The rise of modern medicine has had radical implications for the presence of death in our lives, and most of those implications are wonderful. They really are. Death in childbirth for mothers and for infants has drastically declined in the West. So has the occurrence of epidemics like smallpox or yellow fever. At the end of the 18th century, four out of five people died before the age of 70, and the average life expectancy was in the late 30s. Today, life expectancy is 80 years old. These are wonderful gifts of God's grace. However, there is an unnoticed side effect. The reality of death has been pushed to the margins of our existence. Death is largely invisible. Philippe Aries, in his book, Western Attitudes Towards Death, From the Middle Ages to the Present, gives us a, a, a simple but dramatic fact. From the medieval period until the 20th century, death was a public phenomenon. When folks on the street noticed a priest headed to offer last rites, you know what they would do? They would fall in line behind him and process into the sick room. Did you know the deathbed scene for centuries was a public place? It was essential that parents and friends and neighbors and children be present. Death was no less public than marriage. It doesn't look like that today. Today, death has become invisible. It's been swept away into hospitals. It's been swept away into nursing homes and assisted living facilities. It's been quarantined out of public view. But why? There are numerous reasons, I'm sure. But one observer comments saying that death has been swept out of public view because of our duty to happiness. Our duty to happiness. Death does not sit well with our culture's obsession with happiness, does it? We've graduated far beyond our right to pursue happiness and have come to believe that we have a right to experience happiness. Think about it. Our obsession with happiness drives most of our behaviors. It drives most of our decisions. It drives our consumer economy. If I'm not happy, I should buy something to make me happy. It drives our attraction to psychotherapy. If I'm not happy, I need a professional to figure out why and help me get there. But there is no consumeristic or therapeutic solution to the problem of death. So we suppress it because it is an unanswerable challenge to our happiness. Perhaps there's no better way to undermine it, undermine our obsession with happiness, that is, than by witnessing it. I know the deaths that I have witnessed have left an indelible mark on my heart. 
Watching someone die is difficult to stomach. But it's good for the living to do so. In 2008, a call came into the church where I was serving. The message was abrupt. It was panicked. Dennis McGinley had had a massive stroke. So I got in my car. I drove to the ER. I was greeted briefly by a friend of the family. I made my way into the room just moments after the attending physician had pronounced him dead at 58 years of age. His six-foot-four frame was sprawled out on this crude ER bed. The ventilator was still breathing oxygen into his lifeless body. Bonnie, his widow, had this tear streaming down her face, but a look of shock because it had all happened so fast. That was the first of the kind that I had experienced. Just a couple of days before, I saw Dennis in church. Dimpled smile, Bible under his arm, as you could see him every Sunday. But in the blink of an eye, death struck. Just four years ago, I was sitting at the bedside of Alan as he entered the quote-unquote death rattle stage of his battle with lung cancer a horribly inept way to describe what that's like. He was unconscious. Every muscle in his body contorted his frame, and every breath he took was a vigorous, loud battle. It's difficult to watch. But there's no better way to undermine our obsession with happiness and to remind us of our own mortality than by watching it. Let me know how fleeting my life is, says the psalmist. Teach me to number my days. So I wonder, when is the last time you deliberately thought of the fact that you will die? I would encourage you to make it a daily practice. Daily. Another idea to consider, when... Did you last walk through a cemetery or attend a funeral? Every time you drive past the cemeteries on Bridge Street or Washington, glance over at them. They're calling out to you. This is your future too. Death's invisibility is not good for us. Second, death's commentary. Ivan Ilyich is the title character in Leo Tolstoy's short story, The Death of Ivan Ilyich. When we first meet him, his life is at its peak. He's a successful government official with a fairly lucrative job. He's well-liked. He's healthy. Now, on one level, Ivan had learned of the certainty of death in grammar school with a simple syllogism. It went like this. Chaos is a man. All men are mortal. Therefore, Caius is mortal. Yvonne had no trouble acknowledging the reality of death in general. The problem with Yvonne is that he just can't see death as part of his reality. Well, all of that changes when Yvonne is on a ladder cleaning a window in his home when he slips and falls, suffering a mysterious injury that leads slowly but relentlessly to his death. And from this point in the story, most of the action takes place in his head as he comes to grips with what's happening to him. As his condition gets worse, he realizes that practically no one cares about what's happening to him. He's become an inconvenience to family and friends. They have to break from their normal lives to visit him. And when they do, they talk about anything but what's happening to his body. Mostly, he just lies there alone, dying, listening to the sounds of his family, carrying on their lives without him. Just like Yvonne, we tend to think that death is something that happens to other people. Our own death is unimaginable. Undergirding that, of course, is a narcissism that everyone is born with. We tend to think, because of our narcissistic tendencies, we tend to think the world can't go on without us. But there is a harsh commentary that death makes about us. You are not too important to die. It's incredibly humbling. I am not too important to die. I don't remember the names of my great-grandparents. They've been forgotten by most in our family. It's naive to think that that pattern is going to change with us. 
in a generation or two, maybe three, we will all be forgotten. Your names, your accomplishments, your careers, your contributions will all disappear into oblivion. We're not too important to die. And I would argue that is a significant reason God pronounced death as a real thing in the book of Genesis. Keep in mind, God is the one who pronounced that. In Genesis 1, Genesis 1 is a beautiful poem. It's a hymn to the creator describing God as the only reason anything exists. He creates the heavens and the earth with his word. He brings order and purpose to what was formless and void. He separates light from darkness and regulates both of them. On and on it goes. Everything about this poem is showing God's creative power, his unrelenting purpose, his sovereignty over everything. And the pinnacle of his creation are human beings. They're the only ones created in the image and likeness of God. That's why outrage at Auschwitz, but hiring exterminators to kill cockroaches isn't hypocrisy. But the uniqueness of human dignity isn't the only thing that we glean from the creation account. Yes, the dignity we feel is not an illusion. But the dignity we possess comes to us as a gift. Undeserved. By the God who made us. It is always and only his image we bear. It is his word alone that calls us very good, and it is his world we've been allowed to enjoy. This is what makes Adam and Eve's rebellion such a travesty because it's their attempt to become somebody God didn't design them to be. And so God uses death to make a point. Death is a punishment for human pride, and it exposes our foolish confidence in our freedom to be whoever we want to be. Think about it. Death is actually a punishment perfectly fitted to the offense. It tells us we are not indispensable. The world will go on without us. We are not too important to die. Matthew McAuliffe writes, he says, when I hear what death says about me, I begin to see that I'm not the center of the universe after all. I'm a usurper who deserves to be put in his place. I begin to see that God is the only lead in this story, that I'm a character in a story that's about him. Only when I see his glory and recognize that I am utterly dispensable Am I prepared to be amazed by the message of the gospel? Only then can I see and taste why it's wonderfully good news. You're not too important to die. That's death's commentary about us. Last, death's subservience. If it's bleak, if it looks like it's a dead end, why is it so many people have been able to face death with incredible courage and even joy? For example, the Apostle Paul in Acts 20 says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Sounds like a man who's ready to go. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Or even more starkly in Philippians 1.23, he says, I desire to depart. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. I think we should memorize that one. I think we should recite it to ourselves daily. How many of us can honestly say, yeah, you know, Ozaki County is cool, but I desire to depart, and I'm not talking Florida. <laughs> I desire to depart and be with Christ because it's a lot better than staying here. Can we say that? It's a very interesting story of a man who faced death with incredible courage in the early church. His name was Polycarp. He entered a stadium 
And as he did, the stadium shook with cheers and he appeared before the Roman governor. The governor said to him, have respect to your old age. Swear by the genius of Caesar and say, away with the atheists. See, the Romans believed Christians were atheists because their God was invisible. So the Romans thought the Christians were atheists because their God was invisible. So he's saying, away with the atheists. Say, away with them, the Christians. Polycarp waved his hand toward the clamoring pagans and joked, away with the atheists. The governor ignored the insult. He tried again. Swear, and I release you, curse Christ. Polycarp replied, 86 years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The governor threatened to feed Polycarp to the lions. Polycarp said, bring him on. The governor said he would have him burned. Polycarp said, don't, come on, hurry up, hurry up, don't waste any time. And as they bound his arms behind his back, just before they lit the match, Polycarp shouted thanks to God for considering him, quote, worthy of this day and hour that I might take a portion among the martyrs in the cup of Christ to the resurrection of eternal life. Wow. Where does that confidence, courage, in the face of death come from? Death is completely subservient, excessively submissive to the will, the plans, the power of God. Let me show it to you. James chapter 4. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. God decides if we live. God decides if you live. God decides if we will do this or that. And this has filled God's people with incredible courage and energy and joy over the centuries. Why? Because God is sovereign over the day and time of your death. God is sovereign over the day of your death. You are not at the mercy of Satan. You are not at the mercy of nature. You're not at the mercy of accidents or unexpected diagnoses. You're not at the mercy of humanity's cleverness or evil schemes. God is sovereign over the day and time of your death. Who else do you want calling the shots on that? There's another reason God's people demonstrate tremendous confidence in the face of death. This is the simple yet profound nature of the cross. The very thing Satan used as his instrument in defeating Christ, the cross, was the instrument of his own demise. Satan thought the cross killed Christ, but in reality, the cross destroyed him. The same is true with your impending death. Your death looks like Satan's win. But through Christ, it's your victory. Paul writes about it. He says, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus. Check this out. Before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What has Jesus done? He's destroyed death, and he has brought, not will bring. He has brought, not will bring, immortality. You, Christian, are immortal. Paul gives us more clarity around it in Ephesians 2. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. One of the many theological mysteries that permeate the scriptures is our union with Christ. There are no less than 164 references to the believer's union with Christ just in Paul's writings alone. 
And here we're told our resurrection isn't merely a future hope, but a present reality. You, Christian, are immortal. You have been raised with Christ. You have been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. You're already there. These form the anchor of a believer's confidence in the face of death. You're not at the mercy of nature, accidents, or humanity's evil schemes. God is sovereign over the day and time of your death. And for the believer, death is the gateway to fully living inside the resurrection which Jesus acquired for you and is not just a future hope but a present reality. You, Christian, you, Christian, have already been raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realms. It's a present reality. When Dwight Moody was on his deathbed, his friends and family were gathered around him. And he said, soon you will read in the papers that Dwight Moody is dead. He said, don't you dare believe him. I'll be more alive than I've ever been before. Can you thumb your nose at death like that? Can you thumb your nose at death like the Apostle Paul when he said, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? And we might add at the end of that, na, 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 na. Let's pray. Gracious, life-giving, death-defeating God, teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We need to think about and talk about death as often as your word does. Bring our attention to this dark reality that we don't often want to face. But God, as we do that, may we bring Christ with us in the cross and resurrection of your son Jesus. Death has been crushed to death. We need not fear it. We've been raised with him and are now seated in the heavenly realms. Fill us with joy and hope as we march onward to the day when our faith shall become sight. We ask these things through Christ our Savior. Amen.